Okay. So I think that will actually sit because then I can move the cursor as well. Um, I know I'm not very... Well, it, it, this room is a bit of a strange room. It's a very long room and now it has a screen in one end and a screen in the other end. And <laughs> anyway, but there are very few here, so that shouldn't be a problem. So welcome. Uh, I will talk about level P complexity of Boolean functions. Um, it's joint work with a PhD student at the maths department, Julia Jonsson, who also happens to be my daughter. Um, it's based on, on work she did for her master's thesis, but then we did some extensions and, and tried to sort of make the computer solve the problem for us. So um, just as a little bit of a uh, feeling for what these complexity things are, uh, these uh, polynomials here, this diagram, this diagram shows uh, for a certain Boolean function, which is given in the middle of the slide, the exact details are not important. It's a five-bit function that checks some Boolean property of these five bits. And then you can compute um, a notion of complexity. So how many questions on average are needed, depending on the probability of the bits being zero and one, to determine the value of this Boolean function. And then for for four of the different algorithms, which are drawn here, there are polynomials indicating that some of them are sort of very good in the middle and some are, are very good at the ends. And uh, there is this, I think, the simplest Boolean function for which there are more than one polynomial competing for the, to, to win this. Because if you have a sufficiently simple function, there, there's, all, there's only one winning. I haven't completely understood that. Yeah. So, so it, P is the number of samples you need to determine the function, is that right? No, the, the, the cost is on the y-axis and we'll of course go through all the details and, and this, or not all the details, but most of it. The, the P is the probability between zero and one that an individual bit is one. So if they are definitely one, all of them, that's at the one end of this, which is, uh, let's see, around here. And then one of these uh, algorithms only needs two questions to determine the value of the Boolean function. Why right, another say, algorithm needs five. But it's a question. What is the question? The question is, what is the Boolean result of this function? At a particular point. Mm, well, at a particular point. I mean, it, it has five bits as inputs. Yes. So there are 32 possible inputs, but you don't need to, you don't need to check all the values of the bits because due to logic, sometimes it will shortcut the evaluations. You will know the result after only looking at one or two of it. But the, the, the details that will come later, this is just an indication of, a, of the kind of things we're aiming for, but of course, they, they will need to be explained. Uh, and, and to continue this teaser thing, we've also got, um, so we got a Boolean function. Uh, it can be evaluated in different orders, looking at one bit at a time. And uh, the way of looking at the, the function is, is called the decision tree. And uh, we want to compute a decision tree with minimal cost. That's one of the uh, sub problems here. And one, one way of saying, okay, generate all the decision tree selects the smallest. Um, for, for this five-bit function that we showed on the previous slide, there are 54,000 different decision trees. Um, and if we want to aim for the, the, the sort of running example we got, which is two-level iterated majority, written by three squared there. So it, it's modeling a voting system where you vote first vote in groups, and then the winner of each group votes for, for the winner of the, of the whole thing. Uh, we can estimate that we would need to compute, if we do this naively, 10 to the power of 89 decision trees. And clearly that will not be feasible. And fortunately, yes? I'm, I'm still puzzled. So if you think of your five-bit function, yep. um, there are 32 different possible inputs. Yes. And so you would think there are Two to the thirty-two different possible functions of five input bits. So how can there yes. possibly only be fifty-four thousand different decision trees? Well, the decision tree is telling the order oh, yeah, basically right in which we look at the bits. So yes. that's more restrictive than 
it's not comparing it to a specific function. That's right, each tree has many functions in its, well, has all the yeah. functions in its note. Yeah, yes, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so we, we will get to the exact definitions in, from, from next slide on. <coughs> the, the, the fun thing here is it was a nice exercise of sort of algorithm design and functional programming, so using thinning, memorization, exact uh, representation of polynomials and, and root counting and so on. So for, for the, this nine bit function that we aim for, which uh, Julia had a hypothesis for from a massive thesis, which turned out to be false, of, of which was the best uh, algorithm, uh, we found uh, one which was, which was better. And there's actually only one optimal uh, algorithm for that one. But we'll, we'll get to exactly what this means later, but it has, this is just to indicate on the slide here that we can sort of compute some kind of a uh, polynomial which actually has these coefficients which nobody will have any clue about what they are but the reason I show them is that there was reasoning in the masses thesis about why the suggested algorithm was the best one and I was reading that after it added in and I was saying that how how could you make how, how can you convince yourself that this ninth degree polynomial represents the best possible way and she was like, well, this is this symmetry here and there and so on. I said, well, I wouldn't trust it. Let's just generate all of them. And then after that was when I realized that well, I tend to the power of 89 of them. So um, we had to, it, it was more work than I thought. Anyway, what is this two-level majority? It's, um, it's a simple nine-bit function. So it's given the type up here. Uh, so it takes nine bits and returns one bit. It computes the majority in th three groups and then takes the majority of the majorities. So it's sort of modeling in some way, perhaps the voting in, um, in the US when you have first, um, you vote in this to, to get the electors and the electors vote for the president. Uh, but here there are three, uh, only three groups and only <laughs> three persons voting in each group. But this is an example then, five zero votes, four one votes, even distribution results in a majority of zero. But if you just swap two of them, you will end up with the majority of one. So even though the popular vote sort of has zero as the winner, by suitably placing the borders between the voting districts, you can make the other win. And that's what's called gerrymandering. Which so is exactly what is being discussed about uh, voting systems like the US system. Yes, or yes. Or the British system. Yeah, because the, those who actually end up in power have then the right to redraw the maps <laughs> so that they yeah, are more yeah, likely to win the next time. Yeah. And they have. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, oh, very much. This, but this, this is not about. No, no, no. I but it's, it's an interesting, <laughs> motivating example. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so let's get into the definitions of the, of the different concepts. So this is a, an example of a decision tree. So this says look at bit X1 first. And then if it's zero, look at x3, otherwise look at x2. So notice we don't necessarily have to look at the same next bit. So it's not just an order of bits. It could be that it's sort of strategically good, depending on what you know so far, to make different decisions on the left and the right. For this function, it doesn't matter, but it generally could. And then uh, from when you look at bit three, well, if the majority is the function of computing of three bits, then after having seen two zeros, the majority is already decided. And then the, the, the rule of the game here in the complex literature is that you're, you shouldn't ask any more questions, so you should return zero here. So you're already, already at the leaf. Otherwise, if you're undecided, you got zero and one, then you have to look at the third bit as well, and then you decide and end, end up in one of these loops. So, so now, I'm Go back to my previous question. This decision tree represents one function, right? Yes, so, so each function has many different decision trees, but... Uh, okay, but each decision tree represents one function. Yeah, you can compute the Boolean function from the decision tree. And you said earlier that with five input bits, mm. there were only 54,000 possible decision trees. Yeah, for that function, yeah. Um, it, it strikes me... For that function. Well, because as you see here, we have to stop sometimes. Oh, for that function? Yes. Not yes. in general? Not in general. Every function, the constant function returning true, that only has one decision tree. That's the leaf returning true. Yes. Ah, okay. 
So um, there was a there was a zoom question. Like well. yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it strikes me that um, the uh, the function. If if one looks at it as like an an AST of these bo boolean variables, it's mm -hmm. um, however you swap around the boolean variables, it's going to be isomorphic, right? No. Well, majority yes, but the majority is what you call symmetric boolean functions. So it doesn't really matter which order the bits because the only it's only the number of ones that matters. But otherwise, uh, it it will matter. I mean, if you take the di dictator function. So you got a, a set of votes, and actually it's just one of the votes is deciding the, the election outcome. So if you start checking that vote, then you're done after one bit in the inspection. Right. If you start at the other end, then it won't matter. You can ask lots of bits until you get to the right bits. So uh, I, I mean that, uh, not that it doesn't matter if you swap them around after they've um, gotten a fixed value, but when they're just, when they're opaque variables, then you can swap them around, and you'll get the same um, the, the same function, basically, just with reordered arguments. Um, can you use that to? Well, if, if you reorder the argument, then it's not the same function. But that, I guess, is a question of definition. I mean, if you have a three-bit function from x one, x two, and x three, and and you just swap two of the arguments, then for most functions that will give another, another function. Of course, there is a there is a symmetry, there are symmetries here. So you could map, you can swap around the bits in your tuples that, that go into the function correspondingly. And then you would the composition of that swap of the bits and the new function change that would make this the same function afterwards. So I'm not sure what that has to do here, but yes. Oh, I was just wondering if you used symmetries to like simplify the, the choice of which variable. Uh, to... Well, not really, but we will get to some of the things which are used uh, by if we get through the slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. So uh, back here. Uh, so first of all, we set up here that a function f is a Boolean function if it takes n bits to one bit. And then we have a tuple, um, which is just a, a vector of n bits. And we, we denote, well, we use Booleans, but we denote them 0 and 1 for, for brevity here. Um, and then decision tree can be represented by this Haskell data type. So it's either a leaf, which stores the result, the Boolean. And that's for the case when the function is already decided. For example, the function being constant or after a while when you've fixed a few of the bits of the function, then maybe all the rest of the bits are actually in, irrelevant. So then it becomes constant. Well, like the left leaf. Uh, yes, like the left leaf down here. Or uh, you pick an index in the tuple, and then you have two decision trees, which are if that index is zero or one. So then that's like the first case here. You pick index one, you have a subtree for zero and subtree for one. And this, for example, is a syntactic representation then of this particular decision tree for the three bit majority function. Uh, this does not really store the right invariants. So, just to explain what the invariants we would like, we have also a, an Agatha version. So, this is a little more syntax. We actually implemented this in Haskell. So, the Agatha version is here just for explaining matters. So, this is intended to be the same data type of decision tree but it has two indices, n and f. So n is the number of bits, f is the actual Boolean function it's supposed to be a decision tree for. And now you can see that the, the bits that we return here is only allowed to be used, this constructor, if the function is actually the constant function on n bits returning this b. So this, this does not allow rest to be used falsely. So while the other data type here, you can just say, it's, it's results, even though the function is actually not determined by that. So this is to, to make sure that the, when we generate functions later, we shouldn't generate sort of spurious functions or spurious decision trees for a function. And then you can ask what happens if we have a particular function and an index. Well, we actually have to, the subtree here is not for the same function anymore. 
So this has to be for the function if you set it i to zero. So that's a n minus one bit function. Partial evaluation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So the, the two subtrees here are not for the same index of the decision tree as the, the full tree. So you can see the set bit functions type here. So given an index to, to a, a larger number, the bit function and a Boolean, and then a Boolean function of that many bits, you, you make a Boolean function of one fewer bits. So notice the two, the, the, the last argument to set bit is a function and the result is a function, but it's a function of one less bit. So while going down this tree, you sort of change the function that you are um, doing the decision tree for. It's a specification of the tree in some sense. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a property, it's a relation or a, a property that has to hold of decision trees to any sort of proper decision trees. becomes a little bit too cluttered to capture that as well, but suddenly it's, it's possible to express it. I had a question about that invariant too, actually, mm. which is you say you're not allowed to use pig if the function is constant. Mm. But what if the two subtrees are the same? Yeah. Then the pig is also superfluous. Mm. But if they're the same but not constant, mm. are you allowed to insert a pig? Uh, you, you, you need to insert it. Why? And I don't know. This is the definition of the of the of this uh, of the complexity notion. They say that this these are sort of the rules of the game. You, you should uh, uh, you should split until you get to a constant. But you constant. choose which bit to split. To split. Mm -hmm. And if there's a bit, it doesn't affect the output. Mm -hmm. But I'll take this dictator again. This yes. is a dictator example. So there is basically let's say bit one is deciding the whole election. Yes. But you can make a decision tree which starts looking at the bit from the other order, and that will have a, a recent, ridiculously high complexity compared to the actual. But then, when they define the, the sort of uh, the complexity, the normal complexity notion, they detect the, the minimum. So then, it will sort of all of those will disappear. But it's a bit of a, it's not obvious exactly what the rules of the game should be for this. No. But the, the books on this topic seems to be reasonably um, um, consistent. On, on why on, on this one, but I'm not sure why, because as you say, it, it's not it's not at all an obvious choice. From an optimization point of view, you might want to say, well, if the results would be the same anyway, why why look at it? <coughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Um, let's move on. Um, so this is just to, to note then that well, if we look at this particular tree, the majority function on three bits, what happens if you do choose zero? What happens with the function that you're doing decision tree for? So the function that you had here was a three-bit majority, but at the level one step down on the left, then you actually got and left. Because you're, the only way to get the majority one is if both remaining bits are one. So you go from three-bit majority to and to constant false, and here it's the identity function. So you, the the bit the, the sort of three bit function becomes a two bit function and so on going on and on, on the other side, uh, if you have a one, then it becomes or. So if either of the two bits is one, then the majority will be one. So that's just an illustration of this uh, sort of the fact that the function is changing as you walk down the tree. Um, okay. Well, then they define in the literature the cost of a decision tree. Actually, you could say, they usually say the cost of a decision tree for a particular tuple, but I would say the cost of a decision tree as the function from a tuple to a natural number. And that's the number of questions, well, the, the, the length of the path through the tree when you have this particular tuple. So if, for example, for this tree, if you get one, zero, zero, then you go one, zero, zero, you need all the three questions. But one, one, you, if you have one, 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 for example, then you will stop after only two questions. So the cost uh, at that input is only two, and at the other input is three. So here, for example, actually half of the inputs have cost two, half of the inputs have cost three. 
you just from the tree, you don't see some of the inputs because mm -hmm. you stop blurred. So the, the average cost of this tree is two and a half. The minimum cost is two, the maximum is three. Anyway, just, just to understand the different concepts. Uh, and then what we will be working on, or question? Yes, so I wonder, um, so there's this probabilistic cost, right? Based on a probability distribution of the inputs. Yeah, um, that's what's coming on this slide. Right. Uh, are each of the Boolean variables independent, or is there a probability distribution of the whole tuple? Yeah, so, so one could compute lots of things. What we are computing here is assuming n independent bits, each with the same probability p to be 1. Uh, if you set individual probabilities on all of them, p1 to pn, then it turns out that the polynomial you get for the expected cost is basically the truth table of the function. It's sort of a, you, it's it's sort of as complicated as the truth table because you 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 multiply by p or p one minus p and then we compute all these things. So so but in this particular case when we have we assume independence and and have just one probability, then we get a single normal polynomial of the degree bounded by the number of bits. So this is the the expected cost here. The expected cost then takes given this probability. It's a sort of have a, it's a weighted average of all the different costs for the different inputs. So all the two to the n inputs contribute with one cost and a certain probability, and then you just take the, the weighted average there. And of course, you don't want to compute it that way. You can compute it as a as a catamorphism, as a fold over the tree. So you, you can compute it efficiently. And for this particular tree, it happens to be this function that I drew on paper. It, it's uh, it's uh, two at the ends. Um, if if you're very if the likelihood of a one is certainty, then you only need two questions. That's basically the, the rightmost path here. Similarly, in the leftmost path, it's also the cost two. But in the middle, if the, if the probability is 50-50, uh, then the cost is actually the average two and a half average of the longest and the shortest part. That's not obvious, but that's what's come out. And we got the data type for, for polynomials so that we represent this as a, a list of coefficients for the zeroth, first, and second uh, order terms. OK. Now let's look at uh, just uh, what I was saying about the fact that when you, when you pick a bit, so this is now not a decision tree. This is trying to show the, the structure of the Boolean function. So if you take a Boolean function, like the majority on three bits, and you pick an index one, two, or three, and then you pick the value for that index, zero and one, then you get potentially six different functions here. Uh, in reality, all of the functions, if you choose zero, the independent, independent of i, will be and, and all the functions, if you pick one, is going to be over. Uh, so you could actually sort of simplify this tree structure saying in, in all the ways you get there in a split on zero and one, you get and and or. And then if you continue this, if you have uh, another zero, then the function remaining on one bit is just const zero, on, and the function remaining here on one bit is the identity function. And similarly here, we get this kind of structure. <coughs> So in, in general, if you clean it up a bit and, and ignore the, the fact that you don't, this function is symmetric, it doesn't care about the index. This is sort of a, a call graph if you want to generate all possible uh, costs or decision trees or polynomials for the majority three function. We we'll sort of try to accumulate it from the bottom up in this, in this manner. And this is not a very big call graph, but of course, in the general case for an n bit function, you get a pretty darn big call graph. So imagine, so if you've got n times two calls for the n positions and zero or one in each, and then for each of them, you get n minus one times two calls, and then you get n minus two times two calls. So if you don't use any memoization here, you will get two to the power of n times n factorial calls. That's a bad complexity. <laughs> yeah. That's not something you, you, you want to do. And that's, that's just the number of calls or so, because what we want to do here is actually computing all the, 
all, I mean, the, the specification of the problem that originally is generate all decision trees, pick the one with the best polynomial. But already the number of calls with that, not speaking of the number of decision trees resigned from these ones. But that's, that's moved. So that, anyway, this is the result of recursion structure of the problem. So to make this efficient, then we have to do a few things. Uh, first, the only two apps observate or the observations, I guess, the only two methods we need for the Boolean functions is to check if it's constant, for determining is we should return the result case. And we should be able to sort of make the function one bit smaller by setting a certain index to a certain bit. We will implement it by binary decision diagrams uh, that allows good sharing and the constant time check for of the Boolean function being constant. Um, and then for the decision trees, um, we also abstract to, to a type R. So the, the two methods, the two constructors, result and pick, can be abstracted into two functions, B, or rest and pick, which can then be used um, to immediately not just construct the decision tree, so the syntax sort of tree for this, but you can also directly construct the cost function or the expected cost. Another way of viewing this is saying that we hope we have a decision tree and there are lots of, uh, we can evaluate this decision tree by a fold in different ways and the fold uh, arguments are captured by this tree algebra class. So we can replace rest with rest and pick with pick. So either do an identity function to return the decision tree or you can compute its uh, cost or expected cost directly. So this generic description of this example actually can be chosen to be either the, the, the syntax tree or the function computing the cost for each input or the actual polynomial representing the expected cost. Um, so these are just the in instances. I mean, the, 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 if you want to do the, the decision tree, rest is rest, pick is pick, nothing very surprising there. Uh, if you want to compute the actual cost for each um, input, then this is the constant zero function. This basically recursively course calls and adds one. And for the polynomial, here is where we use this exact representation of polynomial. So the resulting expected cost for the constant function is the zero questions. We already know the answer for a constant function. No bits need to be inspected. If it's otherwise, uh, then you've got two polynomials for the sort of subtrees representing their expected cost. And then the total cost is one plus one minus P. So this is representation of the polynomial for, for the probability times the one, the left, the, the, the false polynomial and for P times the right polynomial in the other case. XP is the polynomial that just contains P. Yeah, so XP is the polynomial zero one, ah. zero constant term, one uh, X term. Yes. So it, it becomes a little clunky here. I could have written it math wise, but then this is actually the Haskell code that's running. So, a bit so this means that I can compute, instead of computing the decision tree, I can directly compute the polynomial. So let's see now the specification of the problem at the top level is to generate all the, well, algebras. I mean, it's, it's whoops, sorry. I have this tree algebra type, so it's, it's generating a set of either decision trees or polynomials, or if I have other instances of this type class, it goes from a Boolean function, which could be well, any instance of this type. In practice, I represent them as, as BDDs, but that's not important here. And then I need to find the smallest set of dominating trees. So uh, I can order the polynomials, but it's partial order. Because a polynomial could look like that or that, and if they cross, they're better in different regions. And that we saw already on the first slide, the sometimes the polynomials cross. But if a polynomial is always better, then I, of course, can throw away the, the, the worst one. And fortunately, the operation that we do when building this tree is monotonous, I guess it is, in, in this order. So you can push the order relation into the generation of your polynomials. So you can decide much earlier. And that's what's called thinning. So we'll get to that in the next slide. But given a pre-order, which will this in this case be the pre-order of the polynomials in practice, 
uh, I can take a set and reduce it to another set. And why is it still a set and not just one value? Well, just because it is a free order. So there might be still incomparable, incomparable polynomials left in, like in the example we saw from the beginning. I don't necessarily get one minimal polynomial. I get a collection, and it could, in theory, I guess, be all of the polynomials if they all cross. In practice, that would be very unlikely. So I get fewer polynomials in this way. How's the pre-order on polynomials defined? It's uh, coming. Okay. To, I, okay. I can. I can. Uh, well, okay. Let, let, let's 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 take it. Uh, okay, so um, but the complexity is specified as generating all the decision trees, uh, compute the expected cost, take them in with that, and then uh, compute the actual expected cost. So the, the min width doesn't actually apply the function, it applies the function for comparison, it doesn't actually map it over the set. So anyway, that, that's, of course, it, it's a very inefficient way. You generate all the, all the decision trees, Many decision trees have the same polynomial, and then you get it by afterwards. And for example, as we said from the beginning, we have on the order of 10 to the power of 89 decision trees for our target function. So we don't want to generate all of them. Um, it would take to the heat death of the universe or something. I mean, 10 to the power of 89 is a big number. It's not just, I mean, even if you divide it by micro, well, 10 to the power of nine, then you still got 10 to the power of eight, it left. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, um, first step transformation wise here is that you can push your expected cost computation. So if you generate all the decision trees, compute all their expected cost, and then take them in with the identity, which is actually just min, then this mapping over a set is already a good thing because before you start to do minimization, you have a much smaller set. So why? Well, it's because the, the expected cost maps many decision trees to the same polynomial. Um, and then, well, it, it's on the order of a, of a factorial reduction in, in the number of <laughs> elements in this set. But still, it, it was doubly exponential from the beginning, so it's still big. Um, no, sorry, that was backwards. So the next step is to say, actually, we can compute the expected cost while generating the decision tree. So instead of generating any decision trees, we can fuse these two into generating the polynomials, the expected cost polynomials directly. And that's because, but well, it satisfies a, a nice fusion property there. So it means that actually we, we only need to compute the minimal generated polynomial. Still, the, the number of polynomials in the example we had, well, the, the five bit example, it was sort of only, I think, 39 or something like that, and we had 54,000 decision trees. In the nine bit function, I haven't even been able to compute the number of polynomials. But a few levels down at the seven bit level, I think it was 100,000 per seven bit function. And then it's squared twice, roughly, when you go up. So it, it, there are lots of them. You don't want to compute them, so you, you need to go further. And that's, that's where thinning comes in. So thinning is the algorithm design technique of trying to get rid of candidates earlier. So it's similar to this, this uh, fusing the map of expected cost into the generation. Uh, it's sort of fusing parts of the minimization into the generation. So you compare polynomials on your way up and try to throw away, this, throw away as many as you can to avoid having this dead weight around. And of course, you have to prove the property that you don't throw away anyone which will be remaining in the end result. But the algebra, algebra goes Some through. commutativity of some kind. So. Yeah, okay. it's, it's, uh, yeah it's, all, it's related to this monotonicity thing. Anyway, this is the algorithm for actually generating these things. It's not very complicated. <clears throat> so we, we, we take in the Boolean function f, we check if it's constant. Uh, the is constant function returns maybe a Boolean. So if it says just B, then it, means it is constant and returns a Boolean. So then we have got a single set of rest B. Notice the rest here is from the type class. So it can generate a syntax tree for the, for the decision tree, or it can generate directly the, the corresponding polynomial, which is in this case, it's a constant zero polynomial. Okay, in the other case, for an n plus one bit function, and by the way, we know 
that it has to be an n plus one bit function if it's not constant, because a, a not constant functions need to look at at least one bit to be not constant. So that means that we can record recursively call ourselves on these sub functions f zero i and f one i, and those were the set bit thing. I just have this notation for them. <coughs> make it shorter. So we generate lots of uh, actually polynomials here. We call them t one. Lots of polynomials here t two. Lots of indices, which are used <coughs> something here, and then we just make the set of all these tickets. Um, which could be a polynomial set of polynomials or a set of decision trees, depending on the instantiation. And the only difference when we add thinning is that outside of this phrase here, we add the function thin. So generate this set and then thin. And it might look like it would be a, a big complicated set, but it, as the thinning is also used recursively at these sort of levels, it's usually not much of a problem. We don't see your cursor. Uh, oh, your... ah, and my cursor has moved over to the wrong screen. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So these, these functions are the set bit things, and uh, the thinning will be inserted just there. So that before returning from each one of these, it will call thinning, which means that there is, in practice, a thinning just before returning from general here as well. So it means that the, there are not too many elements in it. Why does this const return a baby time? Because we want the bit. And to, to, generate, to generate the decision tree, we have to say rest true or rest false. Yes. So we need the bit. So it not, it, it not only checks if the function is constant, it tells you which constant the function is. Oh, I see. Of course. I mean, I could just apply f to some argument, but then have to generate an argument. But that's, I mean, if we already know it's constant, we can just as well return the bit directly. Yes, of course, I misinterpreted. I, okay. thought, I thought for some functions it wasn't providing an answer. Oh, no, no. It, it always, it, if it's constant, it returns just that constant. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, it returns nothing, which means it wasn't constant, and then it falls over to, to the other case here. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Um, okay, so uh, this is kind of an unfold up to whatever structure. We consume the Boolean function on the way down, <coughs> and we generate these other things, decision trees on the way up. And as I mentioned earlier, this can cause ridiculously many function calls for, for the majority function at, at least 100 million calls. But there are actually only 215 distinct subfunctions here yeah, computed that. So, which means that memoization should uh, come up. And as a reminder, what's memoization? Well, if you naively compute recursively the Fibonacci function by calling yourself recursively twice, well, you call yourself recursively twice. Each of those calls calls itself recursively twice. You get, well, actually on the order of fib n calls, which is basically an exponentially growing function. So it's ridiculously inefficient to compute Fibonacci without memoization. So you want to fill in the results in the table and just look them up. Because not surprisingly, the fib of n plus one here will call fib n which is also called here. So that result will be reused and it will reduce well, exponentially many times. So if you fill in the table, then this is all uh, proportional to n, much more efficient. Similarly, here we, we just need to tabulate the result of the course of the complexity function or the general uh, decision tree function. Uh, the problem here perhaps is that we have a Boolean function as the input that we need to index. So, Sure, Boolean functions are finite. I mean, you can represent them by their, their big uh, <laughs> two to the power of n uh, different decisions they have to make uh, or, or result they can give, but that's not efficient. So we actually have to represent here Boolean functions as, well, we don't have to, but we do represent them as PDDs, which is basically a graph data structure and we represent data, that data structure, and we do memoization over that, which is a little fiddly the details, but there's actually a hackage library for Haskell that, that does this more or less automatically, so we can use it. And at the end here, we then get to the function using thinning and memoization, which will give this set of results. And for this particular function that I mentioned, I had on the order of 10 to the power 89 decision trees, and hundreds of millions of polynomials, we actually get a singleton set out in less than a second. So thinning here is, thinning plus memoization here is perhaps unreasonably effective because it happens to be a one element set at all the levels. 
So it generates and it leaves one element sets and it always keeps this one element sets property through thinning. That's fascinating for that function, but for, for the five, five bit function, it didn't have the singleton. And, and if you, yeah, not all Boolean functions would have this nice symmetric property, but it took a few months of getting the code to this level of law <laughs> because <laughs> as, as soon as you do anything wrong, then complexity hits you in the head. Uh, yeah, and then, not, yeah, and then, then you don't see anything. Yeah, you, you wait till tomorrow and it still hasn't finished. <laughs> So, because if you start getting sets of two, five elements and it's squared at each level, you go up the tree, and if you square five, eight times, you get a big number. Um, anyway, um, we don't have much time, so I will not talk too much about polynomials, but it's so I will sort of fast forward over the next few slides. But it's fun to see that this exact comparison of polynomials was also needed to get the thinning going. And this was the question about. Uh, the ordering. Yeah. So when is a polynomial less than another? Well, that's when for all probabilities between zero and one, if you evaluate the polynomial on P, it's less than equal to the other one. So this is a, a property which is quantified over a, rational, over a real number. So it's not something, it's not obvious you can compute this. But fortunately, polynomials have lots of nice properties. So first of all, you can, you can, um, you can subtract the right from the left, so you can just check if a polynomial is greater than or equal to zero at the interval of zero to one, which means basically root count. You have to know, does this subtraction, does the difference between the left and the right polynomial have a root? And there are algorithms for computing roots of polynomials. Now, we should note here, we do not want to compute the actual roots, and that's good because we wouldn't be able to. So notice rational numbers were not, I mean, doubles were first, they, they're approximates. I mean, we need to know really if they cross or not. It's not just if they roughly cross or not. So we need an exact computation. We can't use a rational number because polynomials of degree more than one don't usually have rational roots. It's square roots and all kinds of that stuff. So, Fortunately, we don't need to know the roots. We only need to know if it crosses or not. So we need to know on which side of zero this polynomial stays. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, we have to determine if it's a no root case, if it's a single root case, or if it's some double root, because double roots are still good. Because then it stays on the same. It doesn't matter if it's equal somewhere. It's, it's less than equal here. Was there a question, Zoom? Oh, no. Okay. Well, when I had a question. Oh, yes. Is there a simple answer to? What's the intuition why this pre-order is not an order? Well, take two polynomials which cross. Okay. I mean, p and one minus p. Mm. Okay. Neither is better than the other mm. in in the whole interval. Mm. But both both are then <coughs> candidates for being. The no, but that would be a partial order. Okay. If, it might if, be what if, you say. the difference here. <laughs> okay. So maybe we are talking about partial orders here, uh, and not pre-orders because. It's, yeah. A, a pre-order is something which is um, which is um, uh, which is uh, transitive and what was it? It's not irreflexive. Exactly. So you can have x is less than equal to y and y is less than equal to x without x and y being equal. This, exactly. That's a pre-order. Maybe we are talking about yeah, partial order. Maybe right? we only need partial order. Yeah. 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 So thinning works for the the yeah. pre-order case, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we for the polynomials we actually do get equality. So it is in order, but yeah, it's definitely it's very partial. <laughs> uh, I mean, there are less heaps of polynomials. Yes, and, and it's anti-symmetric. Uh, so, so if if if, if two mm -hmm. things uh, are small or equal to each other, they are the same. They bet in mm -hmm. in in a, in a in an order, even a partial. Mm -hmm. anyway, so anyway, yeah, it's, it's not yes. you know it's not yeah that, that's that's, yeah. that's okay. but um, yeah. So uh, then what we need then uh, is actually using Yun's algorithm for square p factorization. And then there's something called the Kalb's rule of science to, to count the number of roots in a certain interval. Actually, it's, it, the original one is to count the roots from zero to infinity, but you can modify it by count, count the roots between zero and one. And then you sort of do interval halving. So because the algorithm is the Kalb's rule of science either says 
either yes, I'm sure there's no root, I'm sure there's one root where it says, I'm not quite sure how many roots there are, but it's more than one. And uh, in that case, you have to split. Why? Isn't it enough to know that there's one root? Well, the thing is that if it's a double, um, no, so, let's see. But the thing is that you have to know, you have to know if they're inside the interval or not. Oh, yes. So you have to know where the roots are. So, so you start with, you, you try to identify covering intervals for all the roots. And fortunately, you start with an n degree polynomial, so you know that it only needs to be n subdivisions. I mean, at most, but they can be very, very thin because two roots could be very, very close together. I don't know quite how far you can go, but it, it works fine. We try to do some ad hoc at Hockery before, and the, but it's, it's the problem is has so bad complexity from the start that it's really easy to get things to blow up. So I mean, if you did some some simple checks, like okay, if the constant term, if all the terms are greater than zero, then we're done. Then it's definitely positive. Mm -hmm. But then there are of course lots of other polynomials which still are positive, but one of the coefficients is negative. So you don't catch enough cases with an with an HX. Okay, just to sum up, uh, thinning normalization, exact comparison polynomials, uh, we get down to singles and set for each iterate the majority. We have these five or four polynomials left for this uh, five bit function. Future work, doing an agar proof, um, doing even more efficient memorization. And it would be fun to see if we could actually tackle the three level iterate majority. So three votes, and that would be a 27 bit function. But, uh, I think more techniques for optimization would need to be applied then. But it might be reachable because of the symmetries that was mentioned by Liam earlier. Um, so if one sort of codes up a little bit more about the knowledge of the functions properties, it might be possible. So currently the algorithm doesn't really know anything about the function, it just computes. It, it uses thinning and, and exact comparison and normalization, but it doesn't really do any mathematics on the polynomials. It computes them, but no, no clever mathematics there. Okay, so that's uh, that's all. Any other questions? So, if you think of the polynomial or, or the functions with nine inputs, you mm -hmm. consider the iterate majority. Yeah. And this works for that function. Mm -hmm. What about the other? Fun There are only 512 inputs, but for each of the inputs, you have two choices. No, 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 no. But for a function nine bits, so it has nine input bits. But your majority function, it has nine input bits. Uh, well, okay, yes, but yes, okay. But you said what happens with other functions? Yes. Yeah, and there are lots of those. So, yes. I mean, we haven't tried many other functions. We've tried some. For example, you can do the. the <laughs> The, the simplest way is asking the algorithm to do the same, but claiming that the function you're computing has more than the bits it actually uses. So if you claim that this two bit, two level majority has 15 bits, but it only actually uses nine of them, it will, after some hard work, find out that it's the same polynomial, which is the best here as well. Um, but we haven't, we, yeah, it's, it's not clear. We haven't sort of done any sort of random check of different functions there. I'm sure. There are several functions of nine bits for which there will be hundreds of polynomials left at the bottom. Mm. Well, I, I'm reasonably sure. <laughs> it would be strange otherwise. I, I'm, I'm assuming there are sort of very sort of asymmetric functions. The, the two level majority is very sort of symmetric. <laughs> okay, so to, to rephrase my question in, in a better way, you could certainly generate a random function of nine bits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and run the algorithm and see if it terminates in reasonable time. And then. Yes, yeah, so it would be interesting to know. Does it usually terminate with a small result, or does it usually run into? Uh, yeah, yeah know, sure. I mean, that, that's, the code is on the web. That it's a, you can run some tests. <laughs> it would be fun to check. I mean, we we are thinking about future work on, on this direction uh, with agile proofs and so on. We haven't really thought about future work in the sense of of charting the territory, but that's mm -hmm. definitely a possibility. And for example, I claimed. I think that the, this five bit function, the simplest for which we get several polynomials contributing, but there we could actually probably generate all of them and, and try it and, and see. <laughs> That's 
we didn't do it that way. Yeah, so it's um, uh, it's a yeah. question. Uh, yes, so uh, this seems a, a very interesting problem. I wonder what are the uh, the applications for it? I guess speculative execution, maybe? Um, I'm not sure. I just want to show, let's see if this now loads. No, this didn't work. I wanted to click, sorry, uh, click the link for, for both one. So applications in theory is that it should be possible to, to say things about voting systems and so on, but in practice, <laughs> wait about <laughs> really what? say it's useful for that. Uh, I wanted to click. So there is, we got a paper, it's on, on our archive. Um, it's also sent to JFP. Uh, they haven't assigned a reviewer yet, I think, in three weeks. Uh, <laughs> and the source code is on, on GitHub. But um, as to applications, so the, the problem, I, I haven't looked for applications. Um, the problem comes from, from the mathematics department. I think they took it, they, they had been working on things like percolation. So um, they do this um, Boolean functions, which is the connectivity of graphs. And then they try to look at different properties of these graphs. So like, can you get from one end to the other? That's like percolation. Uh, so the uh, percolation here is, is, do you get through does, does water get through a certain uh, corals uh, ground or something like that? that uh, they model it with, with graphs and so on. Uh, so that, that's one of the things. But then, of course, that's this algorithm here is never going to be working for a, for a thousand bit function. <laughs> it's, it's, the, the problem is still doubly exponential. So um, it's just that we've managed to, for, for simply sufficiently simple functions and not to number big number of bits. You do get a, a rapid result. Actually, I'm not sure if it's what the complexity of our current thing is, because it depends so much on the actual Boolean function. So I, I don't have good motivating mean, examples. I, it, it's motivated by voting systems somewhere, but I think if you really wanted to look at like 50, how many states are there? <laughs> uh, and, and then in each state having a, a, a number of bits uh, to go votes, then well, good luck on computing the actual complexity of these things. So you, you can compute the complexity, but you could also you could also save, presumably, an implementation that has that complexity. That would be easy to do with another instance of your class, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 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 when the when I return the polynomial here, I can also return a pair of the polynomial when it's corresponding to this history. Yes. Um, Is that how you got this tree that you showed us for I didn't actually. Sh well, <laughs> the, the 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 problem for, for the majority on three bits yes. is it's a little too simple. So all, all the decision trees are equivalent. Right. Yes. Uh, let's see if I can get this one to go again. Ah, and so it was for your majority of majorities. No, then no, they're not equivalent. Oh, just, no, no, it happens no, to right, be one right. which is best. Yes. So there the, there are lots of bad ways of doing it. Yes. So the thing is when when I mean. The, the, the interesting part there, perhaps, is that she didn't actually, when sort of trying to reason by hand, find this algorithm to be found, which was like 1% better. So it's not a, and, then, and because it has a little bit of an interesting behavior, so it starts looking at bits, and that depending on sort of the conditional probability of, of, of what it knows so far, it makes decisions about the rest. So it's, it's not an obvious, I mean, you look at the tree, because you can, you can print out that decision tree, it's, it's the tree. Yes, <laughs> and it's, but you don't understand why it's doing what it's doing, because it sort of it starts looking at, at one triple, and then it sometimes after one decision it just moves to another one, and sometimes not, and so and so on. So um, I'm, I'm sure there is a rational explanation for what it's doing, uh, but it's not all that easy to read off from, from the decision tree. And it, um, but it was a little bit fun that it wasn't actually what, because you had four candidates and then she, she, she argued rigorously about which of those four was best. <laughs> mm. And that was correct. I mean, the, the one with just of those four is just one of the other 10 to the power of 89 was better than all of those four. <laughs> yes. Um, it was a bit fun that we could actually compute it. I wonder, have you looked into um, approximate solutions to this? So I, I would have, thought that like a greedy algorithm 
that just looks at the you know the derivative with respect to one boolean value or for some you know continuous extension of the the boolean so the, the, the simple answer is no we haven't but i think it's interesting to um, explore what the thinning can do here because the thinning and the relation that we're using for the comparison, we could lax it up a bit and say that, well, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if it crosses a little bit. So we could sort of, in the, in the comparison, P less than equal to Q, we could add a bit of an overlap. We could add an epsilon. And then um, it might be that we could, uh, I mean, it might be that we got zero solutions out because we sort of, um, but it might also be that we get approximates, a, a good set of approximate solutions. I'm not sure how much it would help. I mean, we, we need to a, a good test case where we get actually heaps of results out instead of in this particular iterated majority where we finally got to working, it's just one, which is best and it, we can compute it. But for, for maybe that's a, a way of getting towards the 27 bits. I mean, the three level iterated majority is to try to, to actually do an approximate solution. So what do you need is some good examples of interesting Boolean functions of nine input bits. <laughs> yeah, or more. <laughs> but not too many. <clears throat> yeah, not, not 50. Okay, I think we should close here because uh, it's 12, but um, well. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah very, very nice. nice. Great fun. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, hold on. One more question oh. before you go. Yeah. Uh, so are you guys going to uh, Kizuna or? Somewhere. So, so I would, uh, I would go for lunch. Uh, is yeah, that, is I that a lunch? Yeah. I, I have a lunchbox. <laughs> I will eat here, and I have another meeting. Uh, at Liam, are you in the building? Uh, no. So I, I just had a, a lab session where I like ah. answered questions remotely, but I'm uh -huh. close to. The okay, building. I will stop this recording. <laughs> <laughs>